Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to Megger's Testing Tactics webinar series. Today's topic is feeder protection in power distribution systems. My name is Michael Fleischer, and I'm the digital marketing specialist for Megger. I'll be acting as the moderator for today's presentation and supporting you on any technical issues or questions for our presenter. On the right side of your screen, you will see a control panel that looks similar to this one. Oh, Bill, I think we might still be paused. Oh, there we go. Beautiful. Uh, so on the right side of your screen, you'll see a control panel that looks like that right there. You can submit questions at any time during the presentation by typing the box highlighted in red, and I'll read the questions out during the Q&A segment at the end of the webinar. Additionally, the certificate of attendance, copy of this presentation, and a link to the recording of this webinar will be sent to all attendees in two business days. Our presenter today is Abel Gonzalez, Applications Engineer. Also to assist with the question and answer session, we will have joining us Sugosh Kuber, Applications Engineer, and David Beard, Applications Engineer. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us today, Abel. Thanks, Michael. Okay, guys, welcome to our um, monthly testing tactics uh, webinar. Uh, today, we are going to discuss uh, feeder protection in power distribution systems. I want to say that I want to thank all of you for taking the time in this difficult moments for everyone to attend our uh, our webinars. Uh, so the things that we're going to talk about today is uh, first, what is a feeder and the types of feeder available, the faults in distribution feeders, the types of protection functions used in distribution feeders. We're going to discuss uh, overcurrent uh, protections, reclosers, um, fuse savings and blowing schemes, uh, coordination issues with overcurrent protections, and some challenges associated with protecting uh, distribution system feeders. And at the end, we're going to have uh, a, bit, a few minutes of uh, talking about uh, automation on distribution feeders. So the first thing uh, that we're going to, uh, let's say, address is what is a feeder? In uh, a distribution system, feeders are the connections between distribution substations and primary circuits. Uh, we can see them highlighted here, uh, either for uh, uh, residential, industrial, or commercial um, customers. Uh, the types of feeders available, we have uh, radial feeders, which are, uh, I will say, uh, feeders are the most common type of feeder, and it's a type of feeder where Every customer is connected downstream uh, and they doesn't have a dual injection or multiple injection uh, points into the feeder. A disadvantage of this type of feeders is that when the main circuit breaker opens, all of the customers connected to the same feeder, or all the loads connected to the same feeder um, lose the uh, energy that's been supplied to them. Um, there are uh, different ways of addressing issues like, uh, like this, for example, connections of multiple feeders with uh, normally open ties that can be uh, changed, whose status can be changed if one of the feeders loses power, then we can use the tie to uh, reconnect and provide power to all other customers on the secondary or the second uh, feeder. We will see these uh, schemes in operation and how um, the details of operation of them in a uh, distribution feeder automation discussion that we have at the end of this uh, of this webinar. Other type of feeders that we want to talk about are parallel feeders. Parallel feeders are uh, used to supply, uh, let, let's say, important customers where the continuity supply is uh, extremely important. Uh, in this case, um, more than one feeder is used to supply the customers so that if uh, power is lost in one of the feeders, the other feeder can uh, supply the power of the, uh, of the customer. Other types of networks that use distribution feeders are mesh networks where you can have more than one point of injection of power into the system. This, I would say, are harder to uh, protect and design, but they are much more uh, reliable when it comes to the continuity of, uh, of service. Now, uh, the next thing that we are going to uh, discuss is the types of faults that we have on, uh, on distribution systems. Now, the faults on distribution systems are mostly uh, temporary in nature. We can classify them by the agent that caused the fault the duration of the fault itself, and the type of fault. Now, 
when it comes to agents, we uh, use the weather is one of the reasons why we have uh, faults in distribution systems, equipment failure, some transformer, a cable, a uh, generator, something can fail and we can have a, uh, a fault on a distribution system. Uh, we can have a contact with uh, nature, a tree, a tree limb could touch a, a line and produce a, a short circuit and that could uh, constitute a, a fault. A tree limb could touch two lines and that could constitute a fault as well. Animal contacts, I've seen big birds touch uh, uh, lines in system. We've seen, I don't know, snakes, uh, uh, rats, uh, big animals touch uh, lines and produce uh, short circuits. Uh, they're typically short uh, duration faults, but in sometimes they can last for uh, a long time if the animal is not able to get out of the uh, of the way. Um, vandalism, uh, people um, can never be, you know, eliminated from the from the equation. Sometimes the damage to the network is produced intentionally, and we have to be able to, you know, react to to that appropriately. And vehicular accidents, a lot of times a car, a truck, something crashes against a pole and brings it down, uh, crashes against a house and produces a short circuit that then becomes something else. So um, that can be also a, a cause for uh, a, a fault in a distribution system. Uh, when it comes to duration, we can classify the faults as transient. Transient means a very short duration uh, fault, something like the wind provokes uh, two uh, cables to touch, those cables touch and then they uh, separate. That could be the, the cost for a transient fault, a very short duration. Uh, temporary is a fault that lasts for a bit longer, but and a lot of times it just clears itself. And uh, then we have the permanent type of fault, which is the fault that we have to deal with using uh, manpower, you know, sending people to uh, release the, the fault. It's fault that doesn't clear itself. By type, we classify them as face to ground. Uh, Phase to phase, uh, phase to phase to ground, three phase. This is, I would say, related to the way the phases are connected in the system and when they touch or touch the ground and produce a uh, path of circulation of current of low resistance uh, that can become a, a fault that the protective devices can uh, detect. Uh, we also have under and over voltage fault. Sometimes the fault is not a short circuit per se. It could be an overload that creates a uh, type of uh, fault that uh, increases or decreases the, the voltage on the system, which is damaging for a lot of the loads that are connected in the system and they can even uh, become something else. Faults evolve, they change from one type to the other. A face-to-face -face, uh, fault can become a face-to-face -to, -face to ground fault or can become a three-phase fault. So. Phases in the um, faults in the system tend to change their nature over time if they're not cleared uh, properly. Now, when it comes to transient faults, uh, we find that uh, lightning strikes, swinging conductors, etc., are the most common uh, type uh, of or cause of transient fault. Remember, these faults tend to last milliseconds or sometimes a few cycles of the uh, of the system. They tend to cause minimal damage to the uh, the power line and they tend to clean, uh, clear them themselves. Uh, protection functions are still uh, able to pick up this fault, sometimes open the line, restore uh, power automatically. We will see some protection devices that are used for this uh, effect. Now, temporary faults, uh, faults caused by animal contact, by contact with vegetation. In these cases, since we are talking about a larger duration, remember that the damage that occurs in, a, in, the, in the power system is always related to the square of the current that's circulating and the time. How much time do we have that current circulating in the system? Which means that in this case, the, these types of faults tend to uh, produce um, larger or bigger damage uh, in the um, in the system, um, and they may require time to fall away from conductors. Sometimes you have, like I said, a big animal. I've seen a big uh, animal touch two with its wings. A big bird touch with both wings, two faces, and uh, it can't get away from there. So it takes a little bit of time. Sometimes it's just a tree limb that fell into the ground, into the into the line, it starts bouncing there because of the. Uh, amount of energy that's produced and at some point it may drop, it may not, it may, may be a temporary fault and then become a temp permanent fault. Uh, now, permanent faults like down power lines, equipment failure, this 
uh, requires workers to respond to the damage uh, site, and they are the type of fault that uh, cannot be cleared automatically. Uh, they tend to create uh, a lot more damage and cause uh, economic uh, losses that are greater than the other types of faults that we have uh, been talking about. Now, when it comes to the electrical nature of the of the faults, we have three-phase and phase-to-phase -phase faults. And here, I'm just showing the electrical um, uh, circuits used to calculate the currents that circulate for this type of faults. And now, these types of faults have the uh, characteristic that since they are uh, in, in the fault are involved more than one phase, um, then in this fault we have an amount of current that circulates that depends, um, I should say, on the voltage applied and the impedance of the line. Now, the impedance of the line tends to be very small, which means that the amount of current that circulates for three-phase and phase-to-phase -phase faults is very large, or is usually uh, large enough for the protective device to uh, produce a, um, a trip. Now, when, that, uh, when we have this, it's a clear fault that can be uh, found, detected, and cleared by the protective devices, let's say, relatively easy. Now, when it comes to face-to-ground faults, um, we have the fact that if there were no impedance to ground, or uh, I should say if the uh, face-to-ground fault were with a characteristic that um, the impedance to the ground and at the point of the fault were zero, then we would have this uh, current that we have here, and the current would depend only on the impedance on the line and the impedance on the neutral, which tends to be very small. However, typically uh, for phase to ground faults, we have an impedance on the fault that is uh, typically large and that makes the current that circulates on the during the fault smaller than your typical um, current circulating for the other types of faults, which makes the fact that um, the, the protective device will pick up the fault and react uh, doubtful. So what I'm trying to say here is that for faults to ground, the fault current is highly dependent on the impedance on the fault and therefore um, it's very difficult to uh, locate because we do not know how much impedance we are going to have at the point of fault for face to ground fault. Think that uh, cables that uh, are on, uh, on distribution systems sometimes go over asphalt, sometimes they go over concrete, sometimes they go on the desert, sometimes they go over water. So you're going to have different uh, possibilities when it comes to the impedance um, to the fault. And um, that means that detecting these types of faults is extremely difficult. These type of faults are uh, classified as high impedance faults. And uh, we know that the conventional overcurrent and distance protection have a hard, very hard time detecting uh, this type of fault. There's little effect on the voltage because of the low current, uh, which means that we can also not rely on uh, the voltage to um, detect this type of fault. The currents are going to be very small and there's going to be a significant harmonic content present in the fault current, which is a feature that is sometimes used to detect this type of faults. Uh, there is no single measurable parameter that can be used to detect all types of high impedance uh, fault conditions. Um, now, the fault currents are erratic and tend to decrease over time, sometimes often uh, stopping completely after uh, a few minutes. And this type of faults will persist for, for a long time, which can go from seconds to, uh, to even days. So we cannot uh, say that the, the, the fault, even if we don't have a, uh, a current circulating, we cannot never be absolutely sure that we have no fault to ground in the, in the system. Now, down conductors, which normally occur due to a, a break in the conductor, usually lead to a drop in the load or a momentary overcurrent. And the faults are sometimes, not always, accompanied by arcing at the point of contact. Now, that's one misconception. A misconception is that when we have a ground uh, fault of this, uh, of this type, we're always going to have an arc. That is actually not uh, true at all. 
Now, how do we deal with high impedance faults? Well, we use a broken conductor detector um, using negative sequence current. Now, when we have a broken broken conductor, that means that we're going to have an imbalance in the in the current, and the imbalance in the currents can be detected by using the amount of negative sequence current that circulates. Now, since the amount of load that circulates in the system drops because of the broken conductor, we cannot use or we should not use only the amount of negative sequence current. It's actually better to use the percentage or the ratio between the negative sequence current and the uh, uh, positive sequence current. Because if the load break, if the load uh, is reduced, then the positive sequence current is going to be reduced too. But the ratio of uh, negative sequence to positive sequence cu cu uh, current is going to actually increase, even if the amount of negative sequence current decreases. So other types of uh, uh, protection devices that are used is what metric protection. Now this is only used for systems with high impedance grounding is not possible to use it in solidly grounded uh, uh, systems like we use in uh, in North America. Ground wire grids is something that you use as, is used as well. It's just uh, running a ground wire across the, the grid. It's very, uh, I would say, um, expensive to, to do. But when you have that, if the conductor falls on the, on the ground wire grid, then you have two things. First, the conductor doesn't fall to ground and doesn't pose a, a danger to the people. And on the second hand, when the conductor falls on the ground wire grid, you create a path for the circulation of current, which makes the amount of current higher and makes it possible to uh, to detect as well. Now, there are, let, let's say, data-based uh, analysis uh, methods that can be used. Since there is a high amount of harmonics in the um, current that circulates in high impedance faults, then we can use harmonic analysis methods. And given the amount of harmonics that we have on the uh, fault, then we can make the determination whether there was or not a uh, uh, high impedance fault. There are methods that are, I would say, patented, like signature-based expert pattern recognition system. I've seen this in some uh, and some relays from some manufacturers, they're partnering with university or they have partnered with universities to uh, detect these systems. And I've seen this resurgence of research on using neural networks as uh, pattern recognition systems for uh, the detection of high impedance faults in the system. Now, uh, when it comes to grounding, and this is just one slide to mention what uh, the, the, uh, the, the different types of uh, groundings that we use in distribution systems, we can have Solidly grounded systems, which are the ones that uh, we use mostly in, uh, I should say, North America. Uh, and when I say North America, I'm including Mexico, uh, the United States and, uh, and Canada. A lot of countries in America in general use solidly grounded systems. There are ungrounded uh, systems which are, which are still used and impedance grounded, which are most uh, more used in, uh, in Europe. Impedance grounded can be resistive, reactive or resonant grounding. And now it's very important to know the grounding method that you use in your system because it has a, a large effect during single phase to ground faults um, on, the, on the system. So you have to know your grounding uh, system in order to be able to properly design and test the protection system that you use in your um, distribution system. Now, another thing that's very important when designing, managing, um, and, and protecting uh, feeders is the amount of load and the characteristics of the load that circulate in the, in the feeder. The more uh, load that we have in the feeder, the higher the settings that we have to I use for our relay. In in some cases, if the variability of the load is uh, very big, then we have relays that can change the uh, settings, um, the settings group from one to another, given the, during the during the day to accommodate for more or less load in the in the system. Now, uh, let's say let's talk about a particular problem that we have in feeders, and it is that. Let's say in this feeder, we have a, uh, a fault that lasted for about two hours. Uh, there was some load in the, in the feeder and for a couple of hours, we have no power in the, in the system. In this case, no, no current is circulating. Every load went back to zero 
nothing uh, is going into the into the system when it comes to uh, power. Now, after a couple of hours, everything is fixed and the load comes back up. Now, when the load comes back up, it will probably come with a very high amount of uh, of load. Why? Because every transformer that was connected to the feeder is now uh, powered up, all of them at the same time. Uh, a lot of the motors that were connected to the feeder were part of the load that was connected to the feeder. Like, let's say it's a residential area. All of the refrigerators started acting at the same time. Um, if uh, we have, uh, if it's the winter, then all the heating systems came back at the same time because for two hours there was no uh, heating in the in the buildings, and now the temperature dropped too much, so everybody came back up at the same time. This means that we're going to have a spike in the load, not unlike the amount of uh, current that circulates when we have a, a indrich on a on a transformer, and that is going to affect the uh, protection systems and the settings in the protection systems because the amount of load that circulates in this case could be as much as three, four or five times the amount of load that uh, we designed our protection system to be looking for. That uh, phenomenon known as uh, cold load pickup uh, is defined as when a distribution circuit is re-energized following an extended outage of the circuit, the amount of current that the circuit takes can be substantially higher than the overcurrent pickup. And the cold load pickup is a composite of two conditions, of two conditions, inrush, which we talked about, transformers coming up, uh, motors coming up, and loss of load diversity. The loss of load diversity has to do with the fact that all loads come up at the same time. Diversity in loads means that um, in a typical uh, feeder, the distribution of the load is random. So not every household will uh, wake up exactly at the same time, not every um, refrigerator will work with the same cycle, not every light will be turned at the same time, so you will have a random distribution of the load. But when you're powering up the system after an outage, then every load came back at the same time and then you lost the load uh, diversity. Now, the factors that affect the cold load pickup, and I'm, I'm not going to read them all here, but we have already talked about the, the type of load, lightning or motor load, resistant heating, etc. You can um, always go back to the slides and, uh, and look at them, but there are many factors that affect the cold load pickup and uh, the phenomenon, even though uh, as a general phenomenon has been described, you can uh, still do some research and find for your particular feeder or for the type of feeder that you're um, protecting or uh, managing how are the characteristics of the cold load pickup in that uh, feeder in particular. Now, how to deal with that is that one way of dealing with it is using uh, what's called as cold load pickup settings. That means that after we, uh, when we power the system back up, we don't protect the feeder for uh, a, a relatively small amount of time with the same settings that we would regularly protect that, uh, that feeder. What that means is that for a few seconds, we are protecting the system. Uh, we are allowing the circulation of higher amounts of currents in the system without considering that to be a fault. And then after some time has passed, we go back to the regular uh, settings. Now, this is an extreme case that I'm showing here, but you could have a regular settings of 0.2 amps on the, on the feeder. And then let's say that you could have 1.6 amps as the uh, settings for the cold load. I know it's an extreme case, but I'm just showing the difference between uh, what you would protect the, reg the feeder regularly and what you would do during the cold load pickup. All of all these, all of these DASs allow the feeder to be powered back up without uh, having a trip by the overcurrent uh, settings during that, uh, that time. Another way of uh, Doing this is blocking the overcurrent settings for a few seconds or changing the settings group in case that the relay that you're using doesn't have um, a dedicated cold load pickup. You could always uh, make the change in the settings group using logic in the in the relay. That's typically possible. Now let's talk about uh, actual feeder protection. Uh, let's say devices. Now, when it comes to protective devices in uh, feeders, we use relays, uh, reclosers, 
uh, fuses and sectionalizers. And the uh, relays that we use are electromechanical, static, or microprocessor. I know, depending on the place in the world where you are, in some places you can't find electromechanical relays anymore. In other places, all you find is electromechanical, and mo but mostly um, we still find a combination of electromechanical and microprocessor relays. Now, physically, this is how the uh, devices would look like. Uh, we have uh, fuses here, reclosers, sectionalizers, and a combination of um, electromechanical, static, and microprocessor relays used for uh, feeder uh, protection. We are going to discuss a little bit about some of these, um, let's say, devices uh, after, I mean, during the, the presentation. Now, uh, when it comes to protection functions, I hope everyone uh, on the um, a webinar now is at least familiar with the ANSI numbers. In this case, I'm talking about instantaneous and time over current for phase, neutral, ground, and this would be the negative sequence over current. Notice that I have done a, I should say, somewhat abstract uh, protection connection here where they're all connected to the, the CTs. For some relays, you would find a more specific a connection with a ground CT, or in some cases with a residual current uh, calculation. Uh, this is just a schematic, so I haven't been, I haven't connected all the specific details uh, of the uh, protections. Now, voltage-related uh, functions, under and over voltage, ground over voltage, negative sequence over voltage uh, protection is also used for sequence and you also have even though we are not going to talk about them you also have distance protection uh, frequency elements on feeder uh, protections you have power um, elements on balance relays and directional overcurrent uh, relays now all of this use both the information from the voltage and the current devices finally i would say one of the most common uh, commonly used types of protection devices for feeders is the uh, uh, recloser, which um, works in conjunction with the synchronizer, not always. I have presented it like that in here because it is becoming more and more common for uh, recloser relays to have um, voltage sensors on both sides of the, of the breaker so that they can check if there is voltage on the other side and perform a synchronizing uh, function before reclosing to be used in automation systems as we will see later. Now, instantaneous overcurrent, and this is uh, just a small uh, explanation, instantaneous, over, instantaneous overcurrent works by uh, sensing the current, selecting an amount of current um, after which the protection function is going to trip. For example, here, we have the pickup, which is the uh, minimum amount of current that the relay will require for it to operate. The actual fault current will be this uh, a red line that we have here, and the operate region is on the right of the pickup side, which means that if we have fault current of this, of this much, the relay will, uh, will trip. Now, this is instantaneous overcurrent. Instantaneous is um, more... I would say accurately described as an overcurrent protection with no intentional time delay. It doesn't mean that because instantaneous doesn't really mean anything in the uh, physical world. It's impossible to be instantaneous. Now, you have uh, the possibility of using an uh, quote unquote instantaneous uh, overcurrent relay with an intentional time delay. Uh, this is a definite time uh, relay, in which case it will wait for some time before tripping and this is where the relay will uh, operate now other types of uh, overcurrent protections are the time overcurrent protection now the time overcurrent protection also known as inverse time overcurrent protection because there is an inverse relationship between the current and the trip time uh, it has an asymptote on the pickup it should never pick uh, pick uh, trip at the pickup and the operate region is inversely related, uh, an inverse relationship between time and current. The, the higher the current, the lower the time, the lower the current, the higher the time. And if the current is lower than the pickup, it should never trip. Uh, this is how you would uh, calculate the time on, or the operating time on a uh, time over current protection. Now we have here, we have the curves and C defines 
the curves, IEC also defines them, and you can find uh, curves from different manufacturers, and you can find curves for reclosers. It's, a, I would say, it's a big field, um, knowing all the types of uh, curves out there, uh, which makes it very rich and very, um, I should say, uh, prone for development. Uh, remember that we, we don't call it the art and science, and the art is important of, of protection uh, systems for, for nothing. Now, in the case of the um, IEEE uh, equations, we have them here. IEC equations are, are here. Now, see that the time is um, directly proportional to something called the time dial and inversely proportional to a multiple of the, um, the current uh, pickup in each case and with different parameters which give the curve different uh, different forms. In the case of the IEC curves it's the same, they have a time multiplier and the inverse relationship between the currents and the time multiplier as well and the, uh, and the time, sorry. So for uh, time over curves we have this, let's say that uh, in this case, we have a, a fault current that's actually twice as much as the pickup uh, for that uh, for that curve, and this is how we will calculate the uh, the time for this uh, for this curve. Now, notice that notice that we have here a time dial of three, and in this case, we have instead of having one curve like here, we have a family of curves. Now, in a family of curves, what you have is a combination of the same curve but with different time dials meaning that for a curve with a, time, a smaller time dial you're going to have a faster trip and for higher time dial you're going to have faster uh, I'm, I'm sorry a uh, smaller a uh, slower trip right so um, in this case uh, I'm, I want to show you how would you protect a feeder where you have now the colors here are related to the curve that we have in the in the graph. So, for example, uh, the yellow uh, relay that we have here, we call it the feeder relay, uh, is related to this curve here. Notice that this curve, for the same amount of current, will trip faster than the other curve. And this is how you do a uh, time um, coordination between uh, between relays. The main feeder relay will have a higher uh, time. Typically, they will have the same curve, or you would try to coordinate them using the same curve. And this is what's called the time coordination interval or discrimination margin between uh, the relays. Now, if we add a fuse into the uh, mix here, then we have the fuse curve. And remember here, we are changing the point of the fault. And the point is that the device that's closest to the fault is the device that has to, that has to trip. So uh, in this case, if we have a fault on the other side of the fuse, this device, the fuse will have to trip. For that, we have to give to the fuse enough time to trip for which we have to uh, select a proper time coordination uh, interval as well. Numbers that are um, mentioned in uh, standards and literature is that you should give 0.4 seconds between a relay and a fuse and 0.3 seconds between a relay. The reasons for that have to do with accuracy of the, uh, of the relays and accuracy of the fuses. The operation characteristics is more it's more well defined or better defined on relays than it is in fuses, so you have to be able to give uh, more time for the operation of the fuse than you do for the uh, the relays. Now, if we have a case like this, um, and uh, on the side of F1, we have, I would say, coordination. If the fault happened um, in a place where the fuse have to has to react, it would probably trip faster than everybody else. But if the fault happened, on F2, which is something that not the fuse, but the relays have to uh, take care of. Now we have a problem with the coordination. There's a miscoordination because now the fuse, uh, I mean, sorry, the relay represented in blue is tripping faster than the relay represented in yellow. 
To fix that, we typically have to select the proper curve and we have to select the proper time dial for uh, those curves. These things uh, are done today um, by uh, programs, um, software that can calculate the coordination for you. But you have to know the type of devices that you're using and you have to do a proper simulation of the power system. Now, for you to understand the curves, it's important and it's very, I would say, easy to see when you see it in a graphical form like, uh, like this. So for basic rules for coordination is using relays with the same operating characteristic. The furthest relay from the source has current settings equal to or less than the relay behind it. And you have to use both time and current for the coordination. Now for phase over current, uh, they, they must have a minimum pickup setting greater than the expected maximum feeder load current. See the feeder load here? If we select a pickup current that's close or smaller than the load uh, of the feeder, then you're going to trip on the load and not on the feeder. That's common sense, but it's important to point it out. Now, this current may be as high as the maximum load capability of the line. The problem here, the thing that I'm trying to, the point that I'm trying to make here is that you are trying to protect the line from a damage that's gonna uh, make you replace the line. So as long as the fault happens in the load, and uh, and you trip fast enough so, enough so that there is no damage to the line, then you can replace uh, the you can fix the problem on the load, restore power, and everybody is uh, is happy. But if the amount of uh, current that circulates during the or the amount of energy that circulates during the short circuit is greater than the capacity of the line, then you may have damaged the line, and then restoring power could take a lot longer. So you cannot, uh, let's say, set your overcurrent at a uh, at a value that's higher than the maximum load capability of the line. That's not continuous load, though. That's maximum load capability. Every line has their own, uh, I should say, safety margins, and you have to be able to play with them. Now, the peak of value should be 1.5 to three times the maximum steady state load of the current. That's what's commonly used. For ground over current, most relays are set with a pickup range from 25 to 50% of the phase relay pickup. And for negative sequence um, over current, they can be set below load current levels and more sensitively than phase over current. Now, one, I should say, thing that you have to um, be, be aware of on the a case of negative sequence uh, over current relays is that even under perfectly balanced conditions, when you close the breaker, when you close the breaker, sometimes you can have a very high amount of negative sequence simply because of the way the negative sequence is calculated. Relays take a little bit of time, sometimes uh, one to three cycles, to stabilize the RMS values calculation for each of the phases, which means that for some time after the closing of the breaker, you're going to have some amount of negative sequence over current. Most um, relay manufacturers recommend that you do not set the negative sequence uh, over current relays instantaneously, but with some time delay, uh, for uh, close operations of the breaker. When you close the breaker, they say don't set it uh, instantaneously, instantaneously for those conditions. That is something that uh, you have to be aware of and you have to look at your uh, relays to make uh, sense of that and you know use that to your advantage until you don't cause any nuisance tripping simply because you haven't taken that into consideration. And the negative sequence over current relay is important, very important in the in the system. Um, now, I just wanted to show this slide for you to go back later and uh, look at it. I wanted to show the protection zones in the system and uh, because it's something that I'm going to use on the, next, uh, on the next slide. Now, remember that the protection zones are uh, sections of the power distribution system connected at a common point, and they're classified by their location, 
downstream of the main circuit protective device. Why do I say this? Because when we have time over current protection, and I'm going to use this uh, the same slide that we used before, if we have a fault here, um, we have a uh, time, uh, let's say for the main feeder relay, let's say that R doesn't, uh, doesn't trip and the, the main feeder relay has to clear that, uh, that fault. The main feeder relay um, in this case will trip at this time that we have, uh, that we have right here. There is, in this case, the, the thing that the, the reason why the, the, the main feeder relay is going to trip here is because it has to coordinate with this relay. It has to wait for this relay to trip. And if it doesn't, then it has to clear the fault itself. The problem is that if the fault were in this point here, then the uh, feeder relay is no longer important. The feeder relay is not even seeing the, the fault, but you can probably uh, get the same amount of current circulation because if the faults were close enough one to the next, you could get probably the same amount of current circulation and yet you're going to have the same uh, trip time, even though it's clear that this relay here has now to clear this uh, this fault. Now, if we uh, do something, um, let's say change a little bit the configuration of the of the system, now we have the main feeder relay having to coordinate uh, with time over current relays all over. And now if the fault happens there, and let's say that now R, the yellow relay is going to actually trip, it will clear the fault in this much time. But what happens if, because in this case, it is clear that yellow has to clear the fault. There's no other relay uh, downstream uh, R and it has to clear the fault. And yet it has to wait this much time. Sometimes this amount of time that it has to wait creates uh, the circulation of energy that could create hazardous conditions for the, um, for the user, for the people who are operating the system. Now, what if we could send messages to everyone saying, hey, R is now seeing the fault, but not just R sees the fault. Uh, blue and, uh, and green also see the fault, so they tell the people or, or the relays behind them that they also see the fault. What they're doing is they're saying to everyone before it, block your trip, I saw the fault. But who is the only guy who doesn't receive a message? R. So R can trip in a very uh, short amount of time. This scheme is known as zone selective interlocking and it's used to reduce the amount of energy that circulates in loads, improve um, tripping times in uh, in feeders. Now you have to have relays that are capable of doing this, and you can do it all over the the system. Now you would be tripping in this case, and the characteristic is that when a fault appears, the protection units that detect it block the upstream protection unit. And since the only one that doesn't receive a message is the one that has to trip, then it has to. In this case, if the fault happened in this uh, place here. The same thing would happen with uh, with blue, and it would have to trip, reducing the amount of time that it took to clear the fault. Even if we had a uh, protection, a time over current that meant that it had to trip in a longer in a longer time. Now, reclosers are another type of uh, protective device that is very commonly and very widely used in distribution systems to minimize the power interruption time, increase the revenue for the utility, to restore the system capability, and reduce a lot of manpower. And I like to say that reclosers allow the power system to show early stages of intelligence because they have both the muscle, they have the breaker, and they have the intelligence, they have the brain, the brains in the form of the relay, and they can communicate, which is, I would say, the most, uh, one of the most advanced signs of intelligence that you can have, the ability to communicate with others like you. In the case of the reclosers, they can communicate with substations and with other reclosers to uh, provoke or to uh, set in motion automation systems in the power system. Now, the way the, the recloser operates, it's, it senses the normal conditions on the system. If a fault occurs, the recloser clears the fault. After some time, it will go back 
and uh, and reclose if the fault was still present it will of course trip again and it will do that several times until the full cycle of the recloser has been uh, completed now when i when the full cycle of the recloser has been completed if the fault is still there then that fault is classified as permanent remember when we um classified our faults as transient uh, temporary and uh, and permanent now 80 percent of the uh, faults in the in the system are either transient or temporary which means that they are typically going to clean themselves or clear themselves out of the system which also means that the recloser assumes for the first few operations that the faults are either transient or temporary and that they're going to be cleared by the time the reclose happens. Now, if that doesn't happen, by this time, the recloser has given enough time to the system, to, to the fault, to restore. So if that doesn't happen, then what the recloser does is trips and it locks out. What, uh, what that does is that it declares the fault as permanent and you have to go and find us the, the problem in the, in the system. Now, uh, I know there's a lot. We have done webinars on reclosers, so I encourage you to go look uh, into the reclosers in uh, more in depth. But it is another tool that you have uh, at your disposal, not just on distribution systems. They are actually used everywhere uh, on the uh, power uh, system. Now, the schemes that uh, we have in the system are the fuse saving schemes. Remember that we talked about uh, fuses. Now. Fuses are a type of protective device that cannot restore itself. So when it opens, it you have to either replace it or reclose it, right? Typically, you have to replace it. That's the feature of the of the fuse. You have to just go there and replace the the fuse. It takes time. It takes uh, money. So our schemes have been devised to save the fuse by uh, attempting to clear the fault by another device. Remember, this all has to do with the fact that 90% of the faults in the system are classified as transient or temporary. So why let the fuse blow if we think that the fault is temporary in nature and that there is some source interrupting device that can act faster than the fuse and that I can control and reclose on the hopes that the fault has cleared by the time I have. So what we do is we select uh, curves that are faster and slower than the fuse, and we use them in combination with the fuse in order to save or avoid the tripping of the fuse. If we uh, use a fast curve like uh, we have here, that means that if a fault happens here, this guy is going to open faster than the time of the of the um, of the uh, fuse remember that the closer you are to here the faster you are going to trip for the same amount of uh, amount of current now if after one or two shots the fuse hasn't i mean the the fault hasn't cleared then you have to let the, the fuse blow there is nothing you can do about uh, about that uh, on the other hand the uh, fuses accumulate damage over time, which means that even if you saved it for a few uh, during the, the fuse saving scheme, it may blow uh, with an instantaneous trip, particularly during a uh, peak load. Right now, there is another one, which is the fuse blowing scheme. In this case, you want the fuse to blow before. And that has to do with your design and how you, um, in how you, uh, how your system is composed. What are your most important loads and what are your less important loads? Because in the fuse saving uh, scheme, if we look at the fuse saving scheme, by saving the fuse, we are leaving everyone else without power. In the fuse blowing scheme. We are letting the fuse blow, but everyone else on the re on the uh, uh, feeder has power. Now, for fuse blowing, what you do is you use the recloser on a slower curve, and you give time to the fuse uh, for the fuse to uh, to blow. 
um, you select in, in this case, you have, this is your interrupting device. Now the coordination of your interrupting device has not, has to do with the fuse and your trip cannot reach the downstream recloser. Now this area here is the problem of the downstream recloser. You may be able to coordinate with it, but you cannot trip instantaneously on the downstream uh, recloser. You have to wait for the fuse to blow, but you don't have, you cannot, uh, and but you also have to wait long enough for the downstream recloser to uh, to operate. Um, other uh, instruments or uh, protection devices that are used in the distribution system are sectionalizers. Now, uh, a sectionalizer is a protective device that automatically isolates a faulted section of the line. How does it do it? Well, I don't have an animation for this, um, but the way the, the sectionalizer works is it counts the amount of times that it has seen both a fault and a loss of power. Um, I know uh, this is a, an overgeneralization because there are going to be out there sectionalizers that only count uh, the amount of time it has lost power and, and whatnot. But the most uh, typical, and I should say the most uh, better or the, the better way to, to do this would be the sectionalizer counting the amount of times it has seen a fault and it also has seen a, a drop of power, meaning that the sectionalizer is counting the number of shots that the recloser is doing. After a certain amount of shots, the sectionalizer uh, opens up. The sectionalizer cannot open under load, so it has to open while the recloser is on the uh, tripped time, right? Or on the wait time. The, uh, the advantage of that is that if the fault happens in this place uh, here, downstream, the first uh, sectionalizer, then the recloser will do three shots. After three shots, this guy will open and then everybody else uh, will uh, have power restored once the recloser restores power because the fault is going to be isolated by the operation of the sectionalizer. The sectionalizers typically do not have interrupting capability. And the number of counts that's important on the sectionalizer should be at least one less than the upstream device that we, uh, that we have. Now, when it comes to automation, feeders are, as part of the, uh, the smart grid, are a very, I would say, important part of how the automation is being uh, fed or built into the uh, automation, into a distribution system. Now, let's say we have this, it's a simple case of uh, feeders connected with a tie to feeders, feeder one and feeder two connected through a tie here in four. This one is operating on normally open uh, condition. And let's say that we have a fault between feeders two and three. When that happens, the recloser number two will detect the fault and go through its cycle. And after the, uh, the cycle, the recloser number two will stay open. Now, a, we are using, we could we be using uh, directional overcurrent uh, protection or we could be using simple uh, overcurrent. It, 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 it matters, but for the um, operation that we are um, describing here, um, it matters later, not, not, in this, uh, not in this moment. So after the recloser number two uh, has detected the fault and gone through its, uh, its cycle, the state of this recloser can propagate through the network. Now, I am uh, in this case assuming that there is some communication medium between the reclosers, which could be the communication between the reclosers directly or it could be the communications between the recloser and the SCADA system, which then propagates the uh, information that recloser number two sent to the rest of the uh, reclosers in the, in the system. Now, recloser number three will then open because it says, okay, number two open, so I have to open. When recloser number three opens, you can, uh, two things could happen. Now, the first thing is that this feeder 
is now aware that there was a fault after two, which means that it's probably gonna need to power part of the system through the same line. Now it has to figure out if it can take the extra load between three and four. Remember that the load is something that depends on the time of the day, etc. And if it's gonna take that uh, much load, it may have to change the settings that it's using to protect this line because now it's going to take more current and if the amount of extra current that it's going to take uh, goes into the overcurrent protection that it has then uh, it could provoke you know a nuisance trip in the system if it can then it tells everybody hey i can take the the fault so it enables the operation of number four number four closes and then I would say everybody's happy because these guys who's had nothing to do with the uh, with the fault, I mean the line between three and four are now back in service and only the customers between two and three are without uh, power, which is how um, it, should, it should be. Now, there are many different ways of this uh, system. Well, the last thing that has to happen is that these guys, like I said, not just seven because six, five, everybody, has to adapt to the new uh, conditions of the of the load, so they may or may not need to change um, the uh, the settings groups that they're that they're using. There are many ways of implementing this, and you could say what happens if, for some reason, the communication is faulty. It could be because depending on the medium of communication that you have, you could be talking about communication using radio. You could talk and you could be talking about communication using fiber optics. You could be talking about communication using wires. So depending on the communication medium that you have and also the communication protocol that you're using, uh, there could be a problem with the communication at the moment of the of the fault. Faults tend to happen in the moments when the conditions are not the most uh, optimal in the in the system fault happened in the middle of a storm if we were using radio communication we may not have communication between the relays and the SCADA or between the relays themselves so what i'm trying to say here is that you could use this scheme with communication or without communication and you could use one as the backup of the other or you could simply use the scheme of communication and if the communication fails then go back to the regular operation using uh, time over current coordination. There are many ways of, uh, of using this. That's what I'm trying to say. One way is using a um, as backup, using the status of voltages and currents in the, in the system. This guy could know that there is, that it has to change state simply by the fact that it lost power on, uh, on one of it or both of its uh, voltage sensors. Uh, things like that. Those algorithms are in place in some places in the in the world and are, and are employed. If someone needs help with that, we, I can help them uh, figure that out. Now, how do you test this? Well, this the thing with this is that you have to test the reclosers, but you also have to test the communication between reclosers and you have to test the scheme, which means that you may need to have simultaneous current injection in every place of the of the system, or at least in sections of the uh, of the system itself. Sorry, I the same slide twice. All right. So this is just one way of testing the recloser, uh, the simple recloser. You could use it. You could test the recloser using a, um, a device that allows you to inject currents in the um, cabinet or the control without uh, injecting current into the main interruption unit and get the status of the breaker from the main interruption unit by tripping it and getting the signal back or you could use your test set to uh, simulate the tank. Other protection functions used in feeder protection are thermal overload, breaker failure, Selective backup tripping, load shedding, synchronizer. We could be uh, the, the cores and protection and distribution systems could take as much as a week or two. It, 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 it's a lot of uh, uh, content to cover. I, I should say, I encourage you to go ahead and look since you're going to have the product, the uh, presentation available. Good in looking to the other uh, 
protection functions that we have uh, discussed. Now, the summary, we have talked about uh, what is a feeder, the types of feeders, the faults, the types of protection functions used in feeders. Um, we talked in particular about overcurrent and uh, coordination. Uh, we talked about reclosers, uh, fuse saving and blowing schemes. Uh, we talked about the challenges in distribution uh, protection. Uh, and we talked about high impedance faults and then distribution feeder automation, which I presented a simple case. They can be more complicated. You could have three more feeders. You could have mesh networks, uh, etc. As references, I have listed uh, a few here. Uh, this is by no means an exhaustive uh, list. I believe I have consulted over 60 something documents and, and those are the only, the, the ones that I put in a reference list in, in my folder there. Um, I, in particular, encourage you to go and look at the C37-230 from 2007. It's the IEEE Guide for Protective Relay Applications to Distribution Lines, which I believe it's, it's, uh, it's due for an overhaul. It may be in the works. I don't know. Um, I have finished the uh, presentation. I believe we now uh, are ready for questions. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Abel. Uh, so as previously stated, the presentation portion of our webinar has officially concluded. We'll now take some time to answer as many of your questions as possible. If you have any questions, please submit them now into the Q&A box on the right side of your screen. For those of you that are leaving, when you close the webinar window, a survey should pop up on the screen. We would greatly appreciate it if you could take a couple of minutes to provide your feedback so we can continue to improve upon future webinars. On the survey, there's a field where you can also request a demo or a quote on any mega products. A copy of the presentation, certificate of attendance, and a link to the video recording of the webinar will be emailed to everyone in about two business days. You can also view video recordings of previous webinars as well as register for upcoming webinars on our website at us.megger.com webinars and register for our next webinar, element-based testing on a microprocessor relay using Megger RTMS. The presenter will be David Beard. Now let's get into your questions. And speaking of David Beard, the first question will be directed towards him. Okay. David, are open conductors considered to be a type of fault? Um, yes, it is considered uh, a type of fault, but it's basically considered an abnormal condition. <clears throat> so um, when a conductor comes loose, it's not per se a fault, but it's the lack of, right? So uh, it can be, there's there's a couple ways to classify faults. One is a fault that could, uh, is a normal fault that can happen by um, something either getting into the line, line falling out, hitting the ground, but it's still energized at that point in time. Now for non-fault operations could be things like uh, there's no load um, coming to that, to that circuit uh, in, in you're operating a device such as a breaker in a substation for maintenance uh, can be considered a non-fault load. Also, we can have a, uh, a non-fault operation in case we lose something. So if we're actually losing current or voltage or some type of, uh, it, it's the lack of voltage or current magnitude, then the uh, protection, protection device could not operate. So it's if it's classified as a non a, an abnormal condition from what is normally, then we would base it under a type of fault, uh, whether it be in a fault or non-fault uh, situation. Hope I cleared that up a little bit. Yeah, thank you, David. So Sugosh, uh, what is the better method to detect broken conductors, uh, I2 or I2 over I1? So um, so the question refers to Basically, when it says I2, it's about using negative sequence alone. And when it says I2 over I1, it is the ratio of uh, negative sequence to the positive sequence uh, current. And, and, it, you know, and it's one of the methods that is uh, used to detect broken conductors. So when, when we use the ratio uh, of the negative to the positive, uh, the scheme has a bit more security as opposed to when you use the negative sequence alone. Uh, the reason being, that uh, the, when you use the ratio, it will be mostly constant with the variations in your load current. And what this will do is it will provide you more security 
in other words, you can say that a, a more sensitive setting can be achieved to detect a broken conductor. Thank you. David, are the CTI times you, uh, uh, utility specific? We use a CTI of 0.2 between relay and fuse. Yeah, um, so the CTI stands for curve time interval. And um, uh, what we're doing is it's not utility specific. Um, so uh, it can be used in the industrial industry, it could be used in anything. Uh, in general, the coordination is done between the protective devices in the same system or in a series uh, or that are connected in series. So you can use the coordination to make your system reliable. Uh, no matter what that is, uh, the values presented in this webinar are just common values that we're using um, uh, through multiple documents and, and reference material uh, that Mr. Bell has uh, in his uh, presentation. It's always good from a 0.2 to a 0.5 uh, seconds. And again, it, you know, it all depends too is what devices are we actually trying to coordinate between, you know, because nowadays, things are newer, they're faster, their uh, uh, processing times are minimal. And when you're trying to coordinate between new uh, uh, technology versus the old fuse or older, even relay technology, you have to accommodate for some of the uh, inconsistencies. So we have errors in CTs, we have errors in, uh, and that, that brings us to, uh, if you have errors in CTs and you have current voltage magnitude errors, correct? in the relay. So it all depends on how that relay is actually seeing those times and seeing those, uh, not times, but the magnitudes of, of the system. So we need to see also the circuit breaker, uh, how the operation of the circuit breaker is in any upstream device, it's going to uh, interrupt power. We need to figure out what those times are. And as a collaboration, when those times get together, and that's what we try to set uh, the coordination between the relay and fuse or between two relays or two uh, uh, breakers on multiple lines. That's what we're actually looking for. So I, it isn't necessarily utility specific, but anybody that consumes high voltage power uh, can coordinate uh, uh, relays between. Uh, you can do this on feeders. You can do this on uh, even in industrial plants, I, I go back to that because there's a lineup of switch gear. You can coordinate uh, uh, even between different feeders. So coordination isn't only specific to utility, but also the uh, 0.2 seconds um, is just a, a it's, it's a general rule of thumb. It's been written down in multiple references, so we just kind of reference to that. Um, but if you seem fit that that time needs to be shorter, then make sure that you've done uh, everything that you can as far as uh, uh, load studies and so forth to make sure that you're not getting into the crossover portion like Abel showed in a couple uh, slides previously where we're miscoordinating and then uh, breakers downstream are actually operating before they should be. So that's right, it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Sagosh, uh, how do we select between IDMT and a definite time relay? Okay, uh, so this this depends on a lot of factors. Uh, so the IDMT relays, they have uh, inverse characteristics. So what we mean by inverse characteristic is the relationship between the current and the time that is taken for that particular current. It's inverse, which means uh, for a very low current, it takes a lot of time to trip, which is a slow trip. And for a higher amount of current, it trips real fast, right? So Typically, you use this when you need to have some kind of coordination between your overload relays in the system. Uh, so these kind of relays are sensitive since the pickup values are typically low uh, as, as uh, they operate slow, right? So coming on to the definite time relays, they have a fixed time set for tripping. So, you know, you can also consider this as like an instantaneous kind of a protection, but with a fixed delay. So these relays, they trip faster when compared to your IDMTs, and they are less sensitive because the pickup settings are usually higher, as you, uh, as we discussed about the lower pickup setting on IDMT, so so that they do not operate for the inverse conditions. So it just depends on on your system, 
and how you want to uh, uh, work on the coordination and usage of uh, type of uh, relays in there. So based on the definitions and 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 usage of these relays, you know, you could choose uh, pick and choose from them. Thank you, Sagosh. And while I have you, is the inrush and overload condition elements available on every relay? Well, um, I mean, they would not be available on every relay per se. I mean, it depends what kind of relays the user is going to choose, right? From uh, uh, there are multifunction relays, there are single function relays. It can be electromechanical, solid state, microprocessor. Uh, so based on your application and and what kind of element you want to implement. Uh, it will require you to choose a relay with these functions available in them, but but uh, not every relay would have all the elements in them. So. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, so our next question I'm going to send over to David. Uh, how many types of relays are available? So uh, there, there's a lot. Um, there are so many out there, um, especially if you're looking for feeder protection in general. Um, there's what I would just recommend is if you're looking for a specific uh, feeder uh, type relay, um, there's electromechanical styles that are still out there that are being utilized. Uh, sometimes you can get those uh, brought in and you can learn to test on those as well. Uh, just some, some good uh, uh, teaching tools. Um, there's solid state relays, there's microprocessor based relays, and there's basically almost every manufacturer will have. Uh, some type of feeder protection relay. So I would just recommend reviewing their product information, seeing what features are available and what relays, and it kind of gives you a basic overall idea of what's going to be common in feeder protection uh, in general. So um, there's just there's a whole lot to list, and, and to um, you know there's so many manufacturers out there uh, to figure out who's who's got what. So just just look at the ones that you have if you're using them to teach. Or, or learn off of, find some older relays, that would be great, uh, some feeder protection. Um, if you uh, don't and you're actually choosing uh, feeder protection for your system, um, then definitely look at the manufacturer's product literature. There's there's tons of information out there, lots of, of different good uh, manufacturers as well, and they give you a lot of good information in their data sheets and manuals. Okay. Thanks, David. Um, Abel? Could you please explain to me how a negative sequence current works? Also, if a ground fault uh, was there, then there won't be any zero sequence current. How do they differ? Okay, let me, you guys see the PowerPoint, right? All right. Uh, yes, we're seeing you. Okay, all right, that's good, that's okay. So when, when I talked about uh, the the face to ground faults and I, I I'm going to answer the question uh, backwards. Um, when when we talked about the face to ground faults, we um we we, we calculated the um, current that circulates to the fault as the voltage divided by the impedance on the line and the return. Uh, impedance or the ground return impedance or the neutral return impedance, it depends on where the connection is, but in, in general is the impedance that allows this current to return back to the source. Now, if you see here on my, on my screen, I have something called 3I0. That is the ground current. So to, to answer the question, uh, yes, there is a, uh, a ground current circulating, definitely. But what we said was that, and, and that's the reason why high impedance faults are so challenging, that depending on how much impedance you have in the fault, you are going to have a lower amount of current. Now, notice that IA here, IA is the same as 3I0 for this specific type of fault. All right, so since IA is gonna be so low, it's going to be difficult to set, and not just it's, it's, it's low, it's also um, a highly variable parameter, the impedance 
to the fault, the touch impedance or the, the impedance to between the conductor that's touching the ground and the actual ground return is, is a highly variable uh, parameter. We don't know where the cable fell. It may have fallen on the ground, it may have fallen on the asphalt, it may have fallen on concrete, it may have fallen on top of a tree, it, it could have fallen. So we don't know how much current we are going to have and therefore we don't know if there is going to be enough current for that ground uh, fault device to pick up. And that's why we use uh, something that depends not only on the um, impedance to the point of the fault, but we're using a current that whose calculation depends not only on the current, and if you allow me here, I'm going to you know get my pointer back. Remember, we said that IA in that case, and we are using IA as an example, it could be any of the phases, is the current that circulates because of the fault. Now, even if this parameter is very low, IA, we are still going to have some I2 because I2, the negative sequence over current, and remember, I'm not going to go over the whole theory of uh, sequence components. I encourage you guys to go take a look at it. But um, in, in, a, in a nutshell, uh, negative sequence components is a, a, a mathematical tool that allows the uh, electrical engineer to um, divide a, a three-phase, uh, unbalanced three-phase system into three balanced systems. One is the positive sequence system, which has the same uh, phase sequence as the original uh, three-phase system. The other one is the negative sequence system, which has a phase sequence that's opposite to the original system. So if the original system had a phase sequence that was A, B, C, the negative sequence uh, components are going to have a phase sequence that's going to be A, C, B, and uh, a zero sequence component. Now, when the system is completely balanced, negative sequence and zero sequence are zero. When there is an unbalance in the system, you are going to have negative sequence. You can, if you are mathematically inclined, um, demonstrate that by using this equation and uh, knowing that A is in uh, a complex operator that's one with an angle of 120 degrees. So my point is that when you have an unbalance in the system, you are going to have a certain amount of negative sequence component. And depending on the type of grounding and the type of connections that you have in the system, you are uh, sometimes going to have a zero sequence component. Okay, if you have a ground return on a path through the neutral, then you are going to have a zero sequence component. If you don't, then you're not going to have a zero sequence component. So my point here is that when there is a fault to ground, this current will probably become very low, which may make it difficult to detect as a ground fault, but then the amount of negative sequence current is going to increase as a consequence of this one coming down because now the system is going to be unbalanced, unbalanced because in one of the phases, I'm going to have much less current than I had before. And therefore, I'm going to be able to see a fault. I don't know which fault it is. It could be because of the normal operation of the system that the current on phase A uh, dropped or increased. And then I have an unbalance and that is something that is used for different uh, parameters for different reasons. But that's how the uh, negative sequence uh, uh, works. In a nutshell, whenever you have an imbalance in the system, you will have a negative sequence component. And that imbalance can be because um, single phase loads or because of a uh, fault to ground. I guess that answers the, the question. So Sugosh, 
I'll send the next question to you. I believe fuses are the fastest acting protection device compared to circuit breaker. In that case, why are we using fuse saving schemes in if the intention is to delay in clearing faults? Okay, so so the intention here is to be able to save the fuse uh, when a fault occurs and, and trip the circuit breaker before the fuse can operate. Right? We're talking about this fuse saving scheme. So here, the fuse melting point and the breaker operating, that should be compared for fault level at a fuse location. So what I mean by the operating uh, time is the combined time of a relay and a breaker, that time must be less than the fuse melting point for a calculated short circuit fault at the fuse location. So this condition uh, must be true. And that is when you can consider using the scheme. If uh, the fuse melting time is below the protection operation time, then this scheme is not uh, you know, viable. So. All right, thank you. Uh, Abel, the uh -huh. broken conductor element. Uh, sorry, yeah, uh, I'll send this question over to you, Abel. The question is, the broken conductor element is one of the elements available in a relay and, eat, and on each feeder. Can you more explain about the protection philosophy? Thank you. Okay, well, I don't know about the name uh, broken conductor. Um, uh, so I'm going to go with um, a type of protection that um, that I do know. Uh, in some cases, what you have is the case where one of the conductors broke and you lost voltage on that uh, on that uh, uh, phase of the system. So if you lose voltage on that phase of the system, then it's clear that there is a problem and that you have to uh, do something about it. Uh, that could be one of the ways to implement the, uh, the broken conductor. Another way of implementing broken conductor uh, could be this one. Uh, like I said, if you have a broken conductor, you are going to have a, uh, a negative sequence overcurrent. And, and when you have a negative sequence overcurrent, then you can use, um, oh, yeah, and, and so we can use the, um, the negative sequence, the percentage of negative sequence and, uh, and whatnot. So I would say that there are many ways of detecting broken, broken conductor. I encourage the, uh, the, 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 the person who asked to mention the type of relay, and then I can maybe, you know, help him understanding the philosophy be behind that uh, particular type of relay. Sometimes manufacturers tend to call things a little bit different and that creates a little bit of a, a confusion but I can help them, no, no doubt. All right. So David, how would you select the best cord, uh, coordination protection among devices? Um, so the first thing, the first thing we would always need to do is we need to recommend performing a load study of the system, um, right? Because without any type of information, then we really don't know what we're looking at. Um, if there is a, new substation uh, being created that you're going to put these relays into and coordinate downstream, then you have the first and foremost information of where you're going to put everything and you have everything brand new, which is nice. Um, the only thing you have to do at that point is look at loads and what's in the area. But when you're moving into an existing substation and you're adding a retrofit of, of new protection, new breakers, new equipment, then yes, definitely perform a load study of the system. Uh, and then two, you could use uh, any tables or graphs or, um, you know, back in the old electromechanical days, you had the old, I used to call them the potato skins or they're, they're the small thin paper. Uh, that's the log log paper that came uh, with the relays back then and had the uh, old time current curves on them. And you can take those and overlap them because they were thin for reason. So you could actually utilize them to see uh, through to the next side. So you can actually make the comparisons easier. Um, uh, but in the end, you know, the idea is to educate everything, you know, get everything that you need to educate, to make an educated decision on the curves, the interrupting values. Um, and, and especially if you're doing electromechanical stuff, I will say it's possibly uh, really good to get the old test results. Um, especially if you're doing uh, interrupt times for uh, breakers, 
Um, you can, you know, depending on uh, when, if the breaker was cold or if the breaker was warm, it depends on what area and climate that you're in. Uh, it's nice to have a good comparison of what these devices will operate and how they'll operate uh, depending on different weather conditions. Um, that also takes into account some of the um, uh, operations of the equipment, but also your uh, coordination, right? Because you definitely don't want to, you want to be able to have good coordination between a protective device in the winter time if you're using a, a new relay and an old breaker, and then in, in, in the summertime, it, it's, it's so much faster, right? So you want to make sure that you can have uh, all the information that you have at your disposal so you can make uh, good edu educated uh, questions or uh, educated responses and, and uh, uh, setting values. So I probably muddied that up a little bit, but it's it's just kind of nice to know a little bit of the areas of what all you have to look at. Everybody uh, seems to only look at coordination studies, but it's always good to know how the equipment's operating in the field as well, so you can make a better decision on coordinating between devices, so. All right, um, Abel, is there a formula for TMS calculation? Okay, I I um, I believe you're, uh, the, the person who asked is talking about the uh, time multiplier setting on the, uh, uh, time um, current curves or the time dial on the uh, same time current curves. In one case, uh, we are uh, uh, talking about the IEC curves. The other case, uh, we are talking about the IEEE curves. I am going to say one thing, and it is that the uh, time um, multiplier setting changes the uh, the curve itself, what it does is it uh, changes the amount of time that the curve takes to, um, let's say, operate for the same amount of, uh, of current. Remember that we had this comparison here where we had two different curves of the same type. Now, these curves have the same equation. And remember, they are plotted in a logarithmic uh, graph. So these curves, they have the same equation, but they have different time multiplier setting. Now, the time multiplier, as the name implies, is a multiplier, meaning that essentially what you do with it is you multiply every single point in the curve by a constant value. Uh, to answer the question, the equations that are used are the equations of the curves, and you can actually change this parameter. It is a parameter, not an equation, that you can change linearly within the um, allowed scope for that particular uh, function. And the scope is defined in the standards that define the, the curve. Different manufacturers have different curves, and there are a lot of curves out there that have no equation because they were uh, devised by measuring the actual trip time of uh, induction uh, relays or reclosers. So they were actually uh, plotted in a curve by injecting current and measuring uh, time, and there is no equation. Oh, I wish there were uh, equations for, for all of them. Now, the thing that you have to know is how much time do you want to leave between two protection devices in order for those protection devices to coordinate properly when we are using time coordination. So there is no equation here either. What we have are recommended times and yes, you can use equations in the sense that you can say, how much time do I want to give to this uh, particular feeder, given that this particular feeder has this thermal characteristic? And the thermal characteristics of the feeder is something that you can use equations on, and you can do modeling and simulation using those. And I'm, uh, I know that equation um, software that uh, are used to 
uh, calculate uh, the minimum amount of time that you need between uh, uh, breakers and, uh, and things like that, use those equations and recommendations by the manufacturers to determine the uh, minimum time uh, coordination interval or discrimination methods. That's it. All right, thank you, Abel. Uh, I think we have time for one last question. We have that going to David, and that is, what is the function of reclosers? Oh. Okay, um, so reclosers, and uh, I might have a, a bell jump in here too to add to this if you like. Um, so in the recloser, uh, uh, reclosers are a are allowing us to. So you have reclosers, you have sectionalizers, right? And and if we're talking about distribution uh, uh, reclosing, then the reclosers actually hold off a good portion of the line. It's basically a breaker for a specific circuit. So um, if you see in uh, uh, some of the uh, example actually uh, that Abel has up right now um, on the screen is he has a few circuit breakers that he's representing. Those could technically be reclosers, right? So the recloser can actually, it's just a breaker that allows us to uh, uh, open and close uh, a certain feeder section of line. Um, now sectionalizers will break that section into smaller chunks so if you just need to sectionalize a couple of feeders like some rural customers then um you, you could just isolate them from the main feeder line right so that's a that would be a sectionalizing piece if you do a recloser then that's recloser's are used in substations to protect feeder breakers or feeder circuits um recloser uh, uh, distributions you see on poles uh, out in the cities or, or, or out in the middle uh, of the countryside then you know they're sectioning off sections long sections of line uh, where it isn't feasible enough to have a substation out there to section everything off so it's actually a pretty nice device to have uh, in line the recloser element uh, itself uh, ser uh, serves the same purpose it's just not all the time that you see a reclosing element uh, on a distribution line or some type of, of uh, rural line out in the middle of nowhere it's uh, basically for the whole circuit so when you get to like uh, like I was explaining earlier in an industrial plant you might do a recloser on a specific feeder because of a process that you have going that cannot be interrupted so if you have a small uh, some type of fault, not a small fault, but it, some type of fault that happens on that feeder, then you would allow it to reclose, right, to keep your process on. If, if, if that's with all the understatement that if you might have a, uh, the fault might be cleared at that point in time. So uh, there's kind of two things. We talk about recloser as a device and then also recloser as an element. Um, the idea is the same. They, they have the same style of settings, whether it become a element or a uh, physical recloser, but in the concept is the same. It's just fit in two different types of products for two different types of applications. That's it. All right. Uh, so it looks like that's all the time we have for Q&A. Uh, we apologize if we didn't get your question live, but we will be following up with you offline. Guys, we had so many great questions, almost we had around 50 questions and we only have a half hour to go through as many of them as possible. We wish we had more time to just conquer down and hit this really rich topic. But unfortunately, we have some time constraints. But I'd like to remind everyone a copy of the presentation, certificate of attendance, and a link to the video recording of the webinar will be emailed to everyone in about two business days. I'd like to thank you all for joining. If you could, please remember to answer our survey at the end of the webinar. That survey will include a field for you to request a quote or a demo if you're interested. But once again, I'd like to thank you all for attending and I hope you all have a great weekend.